uh, I will make the first uh, presentation and then Alo, or uh, that is what we call him in office, uh, will uh, be making the second part. So the presentation will begin with an overview of the train law and how it actually helped prepare our economy for this COVID-19 crisis, which has affected the economy and the people. And we basically need to manage the risk to move forward. Uh, before I begin with the details, let me just uh, inform you that uh, there are two economic principles uh, that I invite all of you to memorize, dream about, and apply because you cannot escape from them. The first is nothing is free from heaven. Uh, some people think that uh, the government or the business sector or anyone can just provide subsidies or any support uh, to the people during this pandemic. But the reality is someone has to pay for them. And it's basically uh, money from taxpayers. Or if, if we borrow uh, uh, from creditors today, that means you or your children will have to pay for it someday in the future. The second principle is everything is a trade-off. So we have no perfect solution. Everything will have pros and cons, and we will have to weigh whatever policy decision we have to make to make sure that we get the best deal out of them. So one example of a trade-off is, which is more important, uh, saving the people from COVID-19 or saving the people from hunger if we close down the economy and they cannot go to work. So let me begin now with the development story of the Philippines. And I want to start by saying that uh, at the start of the Duterte administration, we only had one vision, and that is by 2022, we reduced the poverty rate from 21.6 to 14% of the population. So in other words, we want to lift 6 million Filipinos out of poverty. And we define poverty as those living below, at that time, 60 pesos per person per day. And we want by 2022 to graduate to becoming an upper middle income country like Thailand and China today. In other words, we become middle class. And by 2040, we have this long-term vision where we eradicate extreme poverty, where no one goes to bed hungry, and we become like Japan and South Korea today, a high income country status. So this is basically our vision. And to uh, reach that, uh, we have to do many reforms. Unfortunately, uh, uh, by 2018, the 2022 promise of lifting 6 million Filipinos out of poverty was achieved. Uh, when we redid the calculation, we realized that in 2015, we had 23.5% poor people in the Philippines. And then when the next survey, because we do it every three years, came out in 2018, we uh, were glad to see that the poverty rate fell to 16.7%. In other words, we have achieved already 6 million Filipinos lifted out of poverty. And this is no magic. Uh, we did a lot of hard work. Uh, this administration, uh, plus the hard work of previous administration and the, co the cooperation of the people, we proposed a 10-point socioeconomic agenda back in 2016, uh, where we wanted to address macroeconomic issues, uh, tax reform, ease of doing business, infrastructure, rural development, land management, human capital development, uh, science and arts, social protection, including what we call now the national ID and the reproductive health. And whenever you see a green, they are largely achieved. And that is the reason why we are able to show strong economic uh, performance prior to COVID-19. The yellow ones are ongoing and we hope to complete them before the end of this term. So one of the 10-point uh, socioeconomic agenda is the tax reform, or popularly known as the train law, which means tax reform for acceleration and inclusion. And the main reason why we wanted to do this is because we want to make our tax system simpler, fairer, and more efficient. So the revenue is important, but underlying that is to make the tax system simpler, fairer, and more efficient. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, we didn't uh, actually need a tax reform if we wanted the country to run in the business as usual scenario. But we wanted to do more. We wanted to bring out people from poverty. We wanted to build the infrastructure. We wanted to become an upper middle income country. So we thought uh, we have to fund all these uh, important investments. And as I mentioned, nothing is free. 
and uh, a, a tax reform that is designed to lessen the overall tax burden of the poor and middle class and, uh, and impose that burden on the upper class or the rich would be the best way to proceed. Uh, let me go to some of the uh, salient features of the train law. The first thing we did was to lower the income tax rates of everyone. So uh, a call center agent, for instance, used to have or has a monthly salary of 21,000. Prior to the train law, that person, or probably your teacher today, has to pay 22,590 pesos per year in tax. Because of the train law, we exempted the first 250,000 peso of taxable income. So that call center agent or your teacher today pays zero and is able to bring home 22,590 as savings uh, where the person can use for uh, to buy a gadget, to go on a vacation, to save, buy an insurance, or so, and so on. Uh, imagine if the husband and wife are both earning 22,000, then they take home close to uh, 45,000 already. Now, the second thing we did is to fix our very complicated VAT or value added tax system. This is the 12% that you pay whenever you buy something, uh, go to the restaurant or travel domestically. Uh, we have a very high VAT rate of 12%, but we have so many exemptions because of the need to help the senior citizen, the people with disability, the cooperatives, the farmers, and so on. Uh, compare that to other countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, they have VAT rates between 6 to 10% and they only accept very few goods or services, uh, basically raw food, education, and health. And that is the disparity of our uh, tax system. We have a high rate but narrow base. We charge normal people like you and me the highest rate but we exempt so many people. So in the train law, what we did basically was reduce that from 140 exemptions to 90 so that it's fair. If you want to buy a good or a service, uh, you're free to do so, but you pay uh, the VAT. Unlike a system wherein uh, person A pays the VAT, person B similar or even richer than person uh, B uh, do not pay the VAT. And you know some of your parents or grandparents are well-to-do enough and enjoy the 12% VAT and the 10% discount uh, every other Sunday in a restaurant or a hotel when in fact those are not essential. Uh, one thing we also did in the train law is to increase the tax on gasoline and diesel. So diesel now pays 6 pesos per liter in tax and gasoline pays 10 pesos per liter in tax. And this is the way to go if we want a cleaner environment, so higher tax for dirty fuel and if we want more equity in the tax system because the top 10% of Filipino families, that's around 2 million households or families, uh, they earn around 113,000 per month. Uh, they consume more than half of fuel products. Why? Because they have cars and many cars. Uh, you might uh, be familiar given your circumstance. So that is why we tax them. And for the poorest, they don't have cars, they commute, and so they will be affected the least. So by raising the excise tax on oil, we actually make the tax system fairer and levy the tax on those who can afford to do so. We also impose a tax on uh, sweetened beverages. Uh, I don't know if you know that whenever you drink a can of Coke, it has 36 grams of sugar. Each teaspoon is four grams. So if you drink a can of Coke or any soft drink, you are taking in nine teaspoons of sugar. And that leads to so many other diseases. Uh, I'm sure you and your family know someone with diabetes and going through dialysis. And more than 3 million Filipinos today have to deal with uh, diabetes and uh, dialysis. So this is something that we want to ensure that uh, children, especially younger people, will not waste away their future because of uh, taking too much uh, sugar. And uh, to protect the poor, what we did was to incorporate in the train unconditional cash transfer, meaning we give 3,600 per family to the poorest 10 million families. And then we provided subsidies for the jeeps and the buses uh, so that they would not increase the fare. 
and we provided uh, a national ID, which is currently ongoing, uh, so that in the future, everything that uh, you want to avail of government service will be driven by a national ID. And so when put together, uh, unlike what the critics say, because uh, probably they did not do the math, uh, the average household actually benefits from the train law. Uh, in, in terms of personal income tax, the savings is 4,495 for Jerry and Eva's family. Uh, they will have to pay a little bit of VAT, excise, and so on, but the red part are much smaller than the green part. And that is why the additional take home is around 4,000. And that is one reason why the economy continues to grow prior to COVID. That is one reason why uh, our poverty continued to fail despite what the critics said that the train law is anti-poor. And more importantly, we are able to raise tax revenues to fund social services and infrastructure. So as a percent of our economy, uh, we have been able to raise total revenues, including tax revenues, to a 20-year high, uh, which was last seen in 1995 when I was in fourth year uh, high school. So you will see that by 2019, as a share of our economy, our total revenue reached 16.1%, one of the highest since the 90s, and our total tax revenue reached 14.5% of our economy, also one of the highest. And this is the reason why the economy is afloat and doing uh, strong, uh, potentially very strongly despite COVID-19. And uh, to, to summarize what I just presented, I strongly believe that these reforms that we did, including the train law, were actually uh, similar to buying an insurance, that we make sure do, that we have sufficient resources prior to a calamity, in this case, a once in a century uh, crisis, and have the funds ready to help the people uh, through COVID-19. And uh, with that, I would like to request Ando to continue the presentation to give you an idea of what is the major trade-off that we are facing uh, given COVID-19 and the impact on the people and the economy. So Ando, over to you. All right. Thank you again, Sec Carl, for providing us the introduction, especially on the train law. Um, so let us first begin with an understanding of the recent developments uh, in terms of our response to COVID. Uh, now, first and foremost, no one ever expected that we would have the Taal volcano eruption back in January uh, that disrupted around 14% of our GDP in Region 4A. Uh, no one also expected that in February, we would have a disruption in our tourism and of course in our trade, as many countries have chosen to undergo lockdowns as a way to prevent the transmission of COVID. And last but not the least, uh, we find ourselves in March 2020 when we imposed enhanced community quarantine uh, limiting uh, travel restrictions, okay? But more than anything else, we want to look into the different um, indicators in terms of how or what we have achieved in the past year. Um, the first of which uh, is when we look at the total COVID cases as of February 28, we have total cases of 576,352, and out of which we have 29,736. Uh, notice that as a share uh, of the total active cases we only have 5% of severe and critical cases. Uh, these are people that require additional hospital care. Uh, these are people that will need uh, additional medical equipment. But the far majority uh, of these total active cases are in fact asymptomatic and mild, uh, possibly informing uh, the, the way we can help uh, more people. Uh, on top of this, uh, it's quite interesting to note that when the cabinet approved the decision to further reopen the economy on October 12, uh, we did not see a spike in COVID cases. Uh, in fact, during the end of the year when we usually experience uh, a lot of these celebrations uh, because of Christmas, uh, we also didn't see a, a lot of uh, a spike in cases telling us or informing us that um, there's actually a decline uh, in terms of COVID cases uh, thus far. Now, um, we've used the community quarantine time wisely um, to be able to enhance our hospital capacity. And one of the, the important indicators for this is that we've increased the amount of total beds from 12,300 beds uh, back in May uh, to 27,000 beds uh, at current. Uh, but if you've, if you've noticed the red line, um, it actually is um, plateauing 
this actually tells us that the beds that are occupied by COVID patients uh, are actually less than half, meaning less and less people are being admitted to hospitals uh, due to COVID, and thus we are no longer overwhelming our hospital capacity. Aside from this, we're also seeing some changes in behavior. According to an Okta research back in December 2020, we see that 93% of Filipinos are starting to wear face masks. So these are good indicators on our end, telling us that these are practices that can be continued and should be continued to further enhance our response to COVID. Now, uh, given these quarantine restrictions and we've reached uh, almost a year uh, under them, what is the impact of this to the economy? Um, first and foremost, when you talk about GDP or the gross domestic product, this is the total production of goods and services uh, for a certain period of time. Um, and noticeably, uh, last year in 2020, we contracted by 9.5%. This was the lowest uh, since 1947. Um, now, this actually translates uh, to a fall in consumption, uh, which actually translates to a total income loss of around 1.04 trillion pesos uh, annually in 2020. So on average, that's equivalent to 2.8 billion pesos lost per day because of our community quarantine restrictions. Now in effect, for an average worker, uh, the income loss uh, per, per worker is around 23,000 pesos. So imagine that it's just an average for each worker. What more for other people who have lost their jobs because of these uh, community quarantine restrictions? So when you looked at Google data, um, it tried to look into the number of uh, people or passengers who were going to transport stations. Again, while there has been an increase, um, we see that it's still 50% down uh, from pre-pandemic levels, uh, telling us that perhaps we need to shift our policies and perhaps we need to focus on key areas, such as expanding the routes, um, expanding the frequency of buses and terminals uh, going to these areas, and also to be able to support active transportation, where we look into providing more active or walking pathways and bike lane networks for the people. Aside from this, we also notice um, that the people who are actually going to work in their, in their offices are 30% down from pre-pandemic levels. Uh, this is partly due to the, again, the restrictions on children that are going out, uh, which in effect reduces the consumption as some parents um, need to stay at home to be able to help and assist uh, their children in online learning. So these figures are actually alarming to us and we want to be able to address these. So um, let's take a look at the impact on the people. Now, in terms of the unemployment figures, so these are people who don't have jobs, who are actively looking for work, uh, who are available for work. Um, there is little improvement in terms of NCR's um, unemployment figures as they are under GCQ. But if you move outside of NCR, for areas outside of NCR, you see some gradual improvement no, from 8.9 uh, from to 7.7. .7. But when we take a closer look, we notice that NCR has 400,000 more people without jobs uh, due to the continuation of our general community quarantine. Now, we wanted to understand a bit more about the situation of the people. Uh, so NEDA conducted a survey, a consumer survey back in December 2020, and we discovered that 27% 20, of parents have to skip work to be able to accompany their children in online learning. Um, aside from this, we also discovered that almost 60% of parents forego at least 25% of their income to accompany their children in online learning. Uh, these are alarming figures for us because it tells us that there are significant productivity losses because of the restrictions uh, in children not being able to go out and as well as parents who, who need to be able to support their children uh, through this time. At the same time, when you look at different uh, social indicators, you look at hunger as well it has the same trend in that uh, almost a quarter of NCR or people in NCR are experiencing uh, severe hunger. In fact, one out of four uh, people, uh, one out of four in NCR are experiencing uh, hunger. But when you move outside towards uh, areas outside of NCR, we see far less hungry people. Um, at, from 34%, it went down to 14%. But closer to home, when you talk about NCR, we have 3.2 million people who are hungry, largely due to the uh, community quarantines uh, under the GCQ. Now, um, we have to take a holistic approach. Uh, when we were able to look at death certificates that were submitted in 2020, 
we noticed that 5% of total deaths were on account of COVID cases. Uh, not just that, but of suspected cases or cases of pneumonia. But the far majority or 95% of deaths were actually on account of different diseases such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes. And these uh, cases actually merit our care as well. Uh, we have to be able to have a calibrated approach in being able to uh, provide for uh, the people who not just have COVID, but also uh, who have difficulties and challenges because of other diseases uh, that may not be related to COVID. Uh, at the same time, when you look at the malnutrition figures, yes, we have seen improvement uh, in, in recent years, but given the fact that we have COVID and different restrictions, this can potentially make uh, our, our indicators much worse, thus reducing the development of cognitive skills of children to be able to effectively finish school. At the same time, uh, in 2018, um, the Philippines joined the PISA score, the PISA test, that focused on reading, English, and science, with a particular focus uh, on reading, um, and among which, um, out of 79 countries, we scored one of the lowest. Um, this tells us that there are, there are significant challenges in educational attainment, um, and COVID could stand to make things worse. Uh, this means that many children or many Filipinos today uh, might not have uh, a, a good time in being able to find good jobs uh, in the future. Now, uh, all in all, um, as you've noticed, there are many uh, COVID cases today. Uh, but then when you look at the, the numbers, the figures, we realize that COVID deaths are at 4,791. But in comparison to the people who are hungry, who are poor, who have died because of other diseases, it's already amounted to 7,000. Uh, 70,192. So in a way, we have to be able to care for all those uh, cases, not just of COVID, but of course of people who are facing significant and severe hunger, and of course of challenges posed because of different diseases, which is why the government is taking a proactive approach in being able to address uh, major concerns. Uh, all in all, uh, the virus will be staying with us for a while. Uh, and again, the most important thing is that we are able to work together during this time of great crisis as maintaining public health standards is, is really the best way to be able to encourage everyone uh, to move towards uh, recovery and be able to help each other um, stem transmission of COVID. Now, Carl emphasized uh, two main points and you want to add a bit more into that uh, aside from the nothing is free from heaven that we also have to consider the constraints in our res resources and be able to think about other resourceful ways on managing what we have today. Uh, we also have to think about um, the trade-offs that are involved, meaning the consequences of our decisions, may it be good or bad. But life in general, we think there are many, there are three important points that we want to emphasize. First is we have to have uh, a knowledge or a desire to know the facts. We have to be able to ground our assertions, our evidence, our assumptions that we form based on our research and, and the additional effort uh, that we go out to verify all these assumptions. The fourth is we have to be able to contribute to the solutions. Let's not stop with what to do uh, because we do have a lot of suggestions on what we can do to really improve the economy, but really how to do it. Um, let's focus more on the, the nitty gritty, the plans on how we can move things forward and how we can help each other accomplish that. And last but not the least, yes, we've seen a lot of bad news. Uh, yes, we've seen a lot of negative news, but it's also important to be able to share good news. Uh, the things that tell us that we're actually improving, uh, news that would give hope to more people as we uh, go through these very challenging times. And we encourage all of you um, to be able to think, to memorize the dream about, and to apply all these concepts in your daily lives, especially now uh, during COVID. Uh, and we hope that this uh, short presentation that we've had um, left you with, with some key insights and points uh, to discuss later on. Thank you very much.